Well, good morning, E100 friends. It's good to be back with you, especially after our longer stretch that we had this month. Thanks for the grace as we got through that stretch of funerals as well, too. The good thing was is that our scriptures really worked well to be able to clump them with each other. And I think you'll see what I mean as we uh, get set this morning. Let me get my slideshow going. So you'll notice everybody that we should be 59 through 67. I took the privilege yesterday of leaving 67, the last supper, to go with all of the what we call the Holy Week scriptures. So you'll notice I'm not going to teach on that today, but have no fear. We'll catch that in some time to come. But here's where we lay out for our readings. I can't believe we're three quarters of the way through already. But in our next one, here's what I was talking about, everyone. Uh, we'll catch the Last Supper in this one, putting that together with the arrest and the trial and the crucifixion, and be able to put all of that together through the Ascension. So that made sense to do it together as a unit. And then in September, we get to go into the book of Acts, which a lot of us have been studying. As we know, the church has made a lot of changes and our society has. We're going back to what did our original church learn and do with each other. So it will be neat for us to explore that as we go through the book of Acts with each other. Our three main questions that guide us as they have all through this year, what did the story mean to those first followers? What does it mean to us as we look on this side of the cross? We know the end of the story. We know the promise of what is to come still. What does it mean as we look through those glasses? And then, of course, how does this story come to me in this time of my life? Let, I do want to say, though, you'll notice a movement between the head to the heart today. I pray that through these gospel readings, you'll see an intentional move where our head is hit with a lot of how the Pharisees, the scribes of the various, the Levites, they try to take on the scripture or the story just as Jesus teaches it but how he moves us to the heart of what this means for us as disciples. So let's say a prayer and then we'll dig in. Gracious God, give you thanks for the gift of your holy gospel, for the ways that your good news speaks life to us in our day today and in the days to come. We thank you for your promises that are carried through and fulfilled through Jesus Christ and the ways that he breaks your kingdom into our world, giving us a sense of hope, of joy, and also knowing that you call us to the places we least expect. Bless us all as we encounter these scriptures through the reading and through the studying, and as we just take time to meditate on them. Thank you for this day, for the gift of each other, and bless each as they come to continue to learn about your word. In your name we pray. Amen. I realized yesterday that I hadn't done any work with the genre besides just gospel. So I thought this would be a good idea just to remind us in the midst of this that gospel is an actual genre, and it does mean good news. And the reason these four books qualify as our gospels is because it has the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There are other gospels to be found in ancient writings. For example, we had to read one in seminary, the Gospel of Thomas but it didn't hit all of these qualifications as well as these four did. Also, as we look at these gospels, think about biography. Many of us have read biographies, so this is uh, one that's readily agreed that it's an ancient bi biography with elements of historical genre. We'll get a lot of that in our next section. That's the reason we say Pontius Pilate in our Apostles' Creed, because we're marking the historical period. The narrative genre, the best example of that are the parables that Jesus teaches. We get that with the lost uh, and found in the scripture we have. And the theological genres, 
theolo theology, of course, means talk of God. And so theological genre is the nature of God, of Jesus, and God's kingdom. So hold that in your mind as we read these different four Gospels. And you've already seen this. These are the four Gospels put up right beside each other and shown of who Jesus is intently being shown as, particularly what the focus is in each one. For example, John's gospel, at the very end, it says, focus on signs and statements. Two of our John readings today, we have him saying, I am the light of the world. And then with the resurrection, uh, the raising of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. An example of how those come through. I'm not going to do so much work between what the differences are of the different gospels, but instead today what I'm going to do is take it in how the kingdom of God is being taught to us, and then particularly in the healing stories, who Jesus is proclaimed to be, and then who we are called to be as a response to that. Just a reminder, those first three are the synoptic gospels. So digging into our first readings that we had, there's an intentional teaching that Jesus is doing, sharing through these stories, various parables, because he's teaching about the kingdom of God that is different to the ordering of our society and our world. And although the first century would have been quite different, there are some things that we just innately do because we are human. Of course, the Good Samaritan, the kingdom of God, comes with no partiality or preference. And the whole story of the Good Samaritan is set up by the lawyer who asks, what must I do, you see my highlighting, to inherit eternal life? And then later, after discussion and before the story, wanting to justify himself, he asks, remember, we have lawyers, we have religious leaders who have been indoctrinated in the law of Moses. And that is about how to keep yourself righteous, how to keep yourself clean. But unfortunately, they've turned it to what they must do for themselves almost forgetting that God is the one that first does. And then the thing that happens is that what must I do, what must I do wanting to justify ourselves, turns it into this individual worry where we cannot be preoccupied with other people, hence the Good Samaritan. So think about the Levite and the priest who walk right by the one who is wounded on the uh, side of the road, of course, they won't stop because if they do, they are going to become unclean, unrighteous. So they are no longer right by God if they uh, touch this person and become unclean themselves. But it's the Samaritan. Here's that theme of the least likely, the unexpected. It's the Samaritan. They do not get along with the Jews at all. The Samaritans are descendants of a mixed breed of people after the exile. So remember back into the Old Testament when Jerusalem was destroyed, when all of God's people were uh, defeated by Assyria, then Babylon, the Samaritans mixed up with those Assyrians. So they are now deemed ceremonially unclean, social outcasts, and a religious heretic considered to the Jews. So to see that a Samaritan would actually do the gift of what Jesus is showing and care for another, unheard of. It'd be shocking to them. But it all comes down to because God's grace is what saves us as we cannot save ourselves, we therefore were freed to act in the love of God's kingdom which shows no preference or partiality. Here's where it really hits our hearts, because we as humans know we like our like-minded people. We like those we're comfortable with, but we are called to those places where we're not to show a preference or a partiality. God calls us to all peoples in love and care. 
So then on teaching further about the kingdom of God, the lost and found stories. I always, when I preach, say parables are earthly stories with heavenly meanings, but I nuance it. It would be earthly story with the kingdom meaning. Here again, we've got Jesus setting up that the kingdom of God comes where we least expect it and to those we least expect with great rejoicing. Just to set up the whole scenario of these three parables, Jesus is attracting the tax collectors and the sinners and eating with them. And table fellowship in that society means you fully accept them. Remember how the Samaritans, the least likely, and now we've got sinners and tax collectors being accepted and loved by Jesus. So, of course, the Pharisees, the scribes, they complain. Just a reminder, these are the stories of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. The main point pushes us right to the huge joy of finding the lost. More joy over one sinner who repents. I hope this digs into your heart, friends. It does mine every time because I like to identify with that older brother who stuck around when his younger brother, the prodigal son, went and spent everything. It's like, why are you throwing a party, dad, for him? He spent half of the inheritance. He hasn't been responsible. I've been here all the time. But the kingdom of God comes in that joy of that one who returns, who is found. In the same way, we can think about it if we identify with the 99 sheep. Our shepherd just took off going and looking for that one, and we 99 are over here. That's what our God is like. Our God comes through Jesus Christ, bringing this kingdom that throws extravagant celebrations for the lost being found because that continues to build the kingdom and we're still part of the kingdom and that's what the father tries to tell the older son so teachings on the kingdom of god now i want to take the miracle stories that we had next and this is pushing us a little bit further about how are then the disciples and then hence us the disciples of today how are we called to respond in the kingdom? And of course, these stories are all put on the power of Jesus, the power of what Jesus can do, but it's a therefore response for us. So another one of the kingdom of God comes with the feeding of the 5,000 plus. Remember 5,000, only men were counted in those days. So we women, we children, you can even imagine with all of us how much bigger that crowd is. For example, my family, the one man was counted. There's three more of us to be in that crowd. But the kingdom of God comes even in the interruptions as Jesus' ministry happens. Often when we study the scriptures, and this is really wonderful how we're reading across the four gospels, when we see a story as in all four Gospels, we know that this is a story to hold true, to carry with us. The point is one of the major points we hold forth in what we believe as Lutheran Christians. Now, setting us up, the crowd interrupts the retreat of the disciples. Right before the feeding of the 5,000 story, the disciples had been sent out by twos, they had been sent out. This is where Jesus tells them, don't carry your bag. If somebody rejects you, shake the dust off your feet and then enter the house if they welcome you with peace. So they just returned. And Jesus, just like he would go up to the mountain to pray with God, to have somewhat of a prayer retreat, reconnecting on their focus. Jesus has taken the disciples up into the mountain and the crowd interrupts them. Hold that word interrupt because we understand that in our lives. Of course, with the crowd, as Jesus has been able to be with them, the pressing need is hunger. And remember, this is the miracle story of the five loaves and the two fish. Sometimes we like to turn this into a story about the, the stone soup. I remember that story growing up, if you do, of how it just turned into this wonderful potluck. 
were encouraged not to go there with this story, but to let Jesus' power stand for what it is, because it's a prelude to the Lord's Supper. When you read it, you probably caught the words when he took the bread. He took it, blessed it, broke it. Just like the words come forth to us when we'll see next time in the Lord's Supper. The disciples really in Luke have a beautiful position here. Luke's story really shows us how they respond. They do not get uptight and seem like they want to just shoo the crowd off into the neighboring villages, but they're genuinely really concerned. It's getting late. They know that people are hungry. They don't ignore the pressing needs. They simply recommend, should we send them into the villages? But Jesus says, no, let's feed them here. And then the disciples so beautifully partake. I love how they get to collect the baskets afterwards. And they have 12 baskets uh, full after. Remember, 12 is a big number. Remember the 12 names of uh, Jacob's sons and then the 12 tribes of Israel. We've got 12 coming back to us and disciples, the 12 baskets, a sense of completeness, fullness. That's what we're encouraged and what we get to be a part of in responding. We get to be a part of that fullness of the kingdom of God that takes the little of two fish, five loaves, and shares it for more than enough. So we're called to be helpful and to share in the ministry. And here's the neat news of how I hope it hits your heart. It often happens in interruptions. Here in the office, we'll get interrupted by transient folks who need some gas money, who need some uh, a voucher to go get groceries, or we get a bag from the food pantry. Maybe interruptions, but exactly the pressing need is hunger. That's where the kingdom of God breaks in, again, in the least likely way. So the next miracle story, walking on water. The kingdom of God comes in the power over the chaos of the seas of life. Few things to pay attention. Jesus is the one who commands the disciples to get in the boat and to go ahead without him. One of my favorite preaching commentary authors I love really suggests that this is like a parable where the boat is life as Jesus' church as we are sent out onto the seas of this world. But he readily says, this is so beautiful. The boat is not filled with like-minded people riding out on smooth seas. Rather, it is filled with peculiar people called by God, sent on the sea that can be dangerous. Isn't that a beautiful metaphor? Oh gosh, there's beauty and church life together, but there's also tough seas that we have to ride as well too. Think about the seas of COVID life we had to ride. But the good news is we are not left onto these seas to our own. There is power to calm those storms. When Jesus comes and he's walking on the water, the disciples are a little freaked out. And they say, is it, who are you? Are you a ghost? And he says, it is I. This is the same I as I am. The I am, ego a me, is what it is in Greek. It's the same God of the Old Testament, the great I am, who comes in the flesh of Jesus Christ. It is I. And Jesus is Lord over the chaos of the sea. Of course, we know this story about Peter trying to get out on the water. He focuses well, and then he gets distracted by the waves, gets nervous, starts to sink. And Jesus says, you have little faith, because he reaches out his hand and gets him to safety right away. So we're called in discipleship, obey Jesus. Jesus is the one who leads us in this boat whether it be in the boat of our family, in the boat of our church, however that is interpreted in your heart, get to share in the fullness of life together. And we are called to move with Jesus confidently on this water with uh, Jesus in the boat with us 
or even if we dare to try walking on water with, we get to move with Jesus, keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ. All right, I'm going to take our last three stories for today, the healing, and I'm going to take us specifically in each one to who Jesus is and then what's flipped around because of the kingdom of God breaking in. And as I have the head and the heart that I always have on there, I pray that you get to move from the head because you can see our religious leaders they're the ones that just stay stuck in their heads. And I don't want to dimin uh, diminish at all uh, our intellectual knowledge, our process of thinking as is so important. But when we come to believe in Jesus Christ and proclaim in the power and the Lordship that he is, we are moved deeply with our whole being, our head and our heart forward. The problem is that the leaders of that day just want to keep it all to the head and it doesn't make sense to them. It doesn't line up with what they always knew. And so faith cannot be held in their heart. The healing of the blind man. This is with the whole mud and the man has to retell about four times how he was healed of his blindness. But this story all shows us the main point of what seeing rightly means in following Jesus Christ. We'll unpack that as we go forth. Who Jesus is, the giver of sight. And sight plays a little bit of a metaphor here that we'll unpack in a bit. Again, we get one of the wonderful sayings of I am, that ego ami, from the Old Testament that is, I am who I am from the burning bush to Moses to now Jesus, God made flesh. I am the light of the world. So what's flipped around here in God's kingdom, it was genuinely believed that if you had an ailment, you did something that caused it, you sinned. But Jesus is showing that sin does not cause the blindness or the ailments. And sin is actually, and I put in parentheses to define this self righteousness, how those who were following God in the old Moses law, they were trying to make themselves righteous by following the law, how that causes the figurative blindness to where they can't even see their need for a savior. They're so blind, they can't see that God and flesh is right before them. And sight, really the salvation only comes to those who know they are blind. Here's the figurative use again of sight and blindness. Because we get the whole flip to where the religious leaders don't even realize they are the blind ones. They cannot see the great I am, the light of the world right in front of them. And think about that brightness of Christ's light. They can't even see that. But true sight comes only through Jesus. That true sight, we believe as Lutheran Christians that we cannot even believe by our own understanding or come to Christ, but only through the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit is what gives us the ability to see, to know that we see because of Jesus Christ, the Savior. That's what the blind man who is made to see. I always think of in Amazing Grace, I was blind, but now I see. I always think of this story, the man who never saw before gets to see Jesus, proclaims who Jesus is, and then goes to tell others of Jesus. Then we get to have the Gerasene demoniac. This is where we get to see giving up control is a main point for us as human beings. As we've had Jesus have control over all these ailments and be able to heal, as we also have Jesus who has the power to go over the uh, sea, Jesus to be the light that forgives sin. Jesus is also the one who has control over the demons. 
there's talk about friends as I was reading getting set getting set and studied that the demons perhaps could be what we know today as mental illness in many different forms. But in that day, think about the science of what they knew. It was easy for them just to call it demons. Regardless of what it was, Jesus has the power, the control over it. You know the story. As Jesus goes, the man comes up, the demon-possessed man. He says he's legion, which legion means 6,000 soldiers of a Roman army. So that's how many demons are inside, 6,000. Humanity, the society thought they could control this demon-possessed man if they just segregate him, if they put him out with the tombstones, if they ostracized him, just ignored him, then they could control it. But they can't. This man breaks through the chains. But notice that even the demons in this man come to Jesus, bow down before him, recognize him. And then the demons even ask, can we go into the swine? Because at least if we go into the swine, we may have a chance to live. And you know the story. They fall off the cliff and die. But God's kingdom comes with power to do things that humans cannot do. Think about that. As we try to have so much control over things in our lives, we don't necessarily all have that power. We might try to segregate it, put it in its category, or just avoid it. But we don't have the power to overdo those things, overpower those things. But God's kingdom does. And it often happens in the marginalized and the outcast. This one is a challenging one for us in our society because we think about who are the marginalized, the outcast. Think about who's not in the center of your hub in your community or in your life or in our society. The marginalized are all those put on the edges. God's kingdom comes right on those edges. And one that I read, this was great. Uh, a commentator wrote about uh, pig farmers that said they cared more about the pigs because of course that's their livelihood. But here again, we get that twist, just like we did with the prodigal son parable. At what point do we care more about the pigs or do we care in great joy for that person who was saved and healed by Jesus? So as we go from head to the heart, you can see, maybe even sympathize, empathize with the religious leaders because it's hard. The kingdom of God challenges and is often opposite, least likely marginalized of our society, it is hard to wrap our head around more or less our heart. And in that way, we can see why it is a struggle to follow Christ at times. But that is where then faith carries us to help us see. So the last story we'll have today, raising Lazarus from the dead. And this, friends, is where the rubber hits the road for us. This is the absolute truth that life comes from death. This is hard for us as human beings because we see the circumstances, just like Mary and Martha did, of the death happening all around us. If it be in the death of a loved one, especially like the funerals, like Jess's that we experienced a few weeks ago, if it be the death or the end of a various part of our society that no longer is the way it used to be. We believe that when something dies, life is promised. And we get that because we have Jesus who says, I am Ego a me, same throughout that we've pulled up this thread. I am the resurrection and the life. Now, resurrection is not new because, in fact, um, I believe that was Mary who says, I believe in the resurrection. The Old Testament souls did believe in resurrection, but that was through the power of following the law, that self-righteousness. Now Jesus takes on embodying the resurrection. This is a prelude 
coming to his death and resurrection so that we are joined to him in a death like his and a resurrection like his. This is the ultimate. God's kingdom comes through what seems painfully unredeemable death. I wanted to put a note in here, especially all our community went through the last few weeks. Distress is normal. Jesus does not rebuke Mary and Martha in their tears. In fact, he cries with them. Mary, Martha, their brother Lazarus are his dearest friends and his friend has died. How powerful it is that Jesus meets us in that distress. Now, one of the questions I want to ask Jesus when I get to heaven is, why did you wait two days to get there? We do get a little bit of an answer where he says, so that God may be glorified, so that you may believe. If Jesus would have just healed them before he died, we wouldn't have seen the point of the resurrection. But it's okay to wrestle with that text, just like I do. So distress is normal. And so is the faith that new life comes. So with those seven stories, of course, I've already called these out, that the re religious leaders believe they have the power to fulfill the law. And if they completely obeyed, they would be righteous through their actions. And they can't figure out this Jesus, especially the kingdom that Jesus is breaking in, because, for example, when Jesus healed the blind man, they thought he was a sinner. How can a sinner save someone from sins, they say? It is because he, he, he healed the man on the Sabbath day, which is a sin. But this Jesus flips all of this upside down. Jesus is deemed a sinner and unclean, just like those for whom he cared, he healed, enjoyed the table fellowship. And just a note, so this gives us a beautiful segue to in two weeks. The raising of Lazarus in John, this is the impetus for Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. If you read a little bit afterwards, this is where they go forth. They figure out how they can plot to get Jesus arrested so that they can go on with his uh, uh, betrayal and crucifixion for us into our heart. Sadly, we do have a lot of Christians who do believe in a theology that is based on our power. We often say it as, if I choose Jesus, a lot of these dear friends, and I do believe God works all the way through, but our Lutheran theology is different. But they say, well, you've got to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. No, it comes first. Is because Jesus' power comes first. Jesus as light. Jesus as the calm and the chaos of the seas. Jesus as the healer. Jesus as the resurrection and the life. So as I put, because he is these things and has the power to choose us in God's grace, and we don't have the power, we therefore respond in acts of love towards others, especially the marginalized, the least expected, the outcast. We therefore celebrate when each is found. I'm part of this uh, vitality initiative that works with congregations. And one, uh, we just did a celebration on Sunday. One of our churches, they shared the story about a family who uh, would be perhaps what we could say least expected or maybe marginalized in our society. There's some of our souls who have uh, crossed the border, and I know there's a whole ramification of politics there, but what happened is this family encountered them in worship, literally, and he shared about it has changed their lives. It's changed their church because they met Jesus in that family that was marginalized as they're helping them to get the documentation, helping them to get what they need. That's where God's kingdom breaks in and changes us. So let me read to you, everyone, from John. And this is, of course, when Lazarus is raised. And then I want you just to focus on what sticks out to your heart and your mind. And then I'll leave you with a question. 
So I invite you into whatever posture is most comfortable to close your eyes, to hear the scripture, or to follow it with me. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that you may believe, they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus! come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to him, unbind him, let him go. So a question to leave you with, as the kingdom of God breaks into this world as Jesus ushered it in, but yet the fullness is to come when he returns, your eyes are brought to see. So I ask you the question, what do you see and notice? Where do you see life come from death? So God bless your continued reading, everyone. Thanks for joining. And we'll see you in uh, a couple weeks again as we meet in September.